Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and welcome back to another early game playbook video as we're covering the White Tiger, Yan Bai Hu. So Yan Bai Hu is the last bandit faction that we are covering on the final patch of the game, 1.7.1, and his starting situation is defined as normal by the game, but really this is probably the, the easiest start in the game, especially for bandit factions compared to the other two bandits we covered in Zhang Yan and Zheng Jiang, mainly because we start in the south. So this might look a bit scary, but most of this is Han Empire and Dong Zhuo, which are the only factions you start out at war with. And if you notice the icons, there is not a playable faction anywhere close to you. So all of this Han territory is free land for you to grab. So it's very very easy to start off as Yan Bai Hu. So the early game part of his campaign is not really difficult. So we'll be taking most of this guide to talk about certain bandit mechanics and his faction mechanics of the White Tiger Confederation, which is very awkward to use and it's also not very strong. But basically, for every ally or coalition member that you have, you will get decreased research time for bandit network, you will get reduced recruitment costs for non-bandit units, these are units that are unlocked from the bandit network, and of course, as a bandit faction, we have access to all the bandit mechanics. That's the different stance that we talked about before. That's the county buildings, the sub building for each county. And uh, of course, you have a different class of characters. And we'll focus on that a little bit more because we still have the Sentinel, Commander, Strategist, the five classes matching the five elements. But for each of the bandit generic class, they have slightly different skills, and you do start out as a sentinel in the game. And that gives you one of the most powerful abilities in the game called Poison Volley. Every single bandit sentinel will have this ability, and this will make your faction extremely powerful on the battlefield. Because you can single-handedly wipe out close to, I would say, 500 plus enemies per battle for each bandit sentinel that you have. And this is on large unit size, so you can scale that up and down if you want. It's basically a very powerful hail of arrows with some poison effect. And all sentinels can learn ability to give themselves stock, which means they're basically invisible assassins that can shoot hail of arrows. Very, very powerful. Speaking of stock, one of your unique unit, the White Tiger Raiders here, available for all characters rank 4 or higher, are probably the strongest unit you can rely on in the early to mid game period when you don't have access to a lot of great high tier unit because they have stock and snipe and they have a spear backup weapon aside from their bow so you can hide them on the battlefield apply poison arrows to the enemy and then have them transition to a spear fighting unit sneak up to the enemy with stock quite powerful you do have a secondary unique unit called the white tiger warriors this is a assault infantry available for any character rank 2 or higher they have splash attack, and they use a big axe, so they're good against shields, but they're very fragile. So you pretty much have to have them in ambush battles, or find a way to get them up close to the enemy, or else they're very prone to getting wiped out by enemy range attacks or enemy cavalry attacks, because they're not very good against either of those. Aside from these two unique units, you also have a Shan Yue camp, and that's a unique sub-building for the counties. We'll take a brief look at this. It will help your research rate and also provide additional unique units that belong to the Shan Yue factions that you can recruit. Uh, those are okay units, we'll also take a brief look when we look at the building inside the game. And uh, I would still stay away from them just because your White Tiger Raiders should be the mainstay of any army. You're using stealth and poison mechanics to kind of empower your campaign. You also have available mercenary treaties like all bandit factions. At this time, we'll actually sign one that we intend to honor because previously we signed a bunch that we basically did not uh, actually honor the treaties. We talked about how not finishing the treaty doesn't hurt you that much. In this case, we'll take a look at how honoring a treaty might reward you as a faction. We do have one noteworthy character. That's our brother, uh, Yan Yu here. Uh, he is a champion. He has a unique ability that belongs to the bandits called Mending. It's a good battlefield heal ability. So between Mending and Poison Volley, your two generals will carry most of the early game fighting. You will actually use no units. And for Yan Bai Hu himself, his traits, nothing too crazy here. Cautious, charismatic, 
pretty good as a leader for additional satisfaction, and you have Patient, which gives him a little bit of fatigue resistance. He's a Sentinel with some faction-wide bonus from his White Tiger background that gives 15% construction cost discount for resource settlements, which are the counties, not the capitals. You will get stock on yourself, and plus three starting rank for all White Tiger units. So these are quite nice, and uh, we'll be utilizing that stock quite early. So we'll be showcasing this once again on Legendary Legendary 40 Minutes. Let's go in the game. China must be liberated. Yanxia 北方盘踞的诸侯却终究是个威胁Alrighty, so we saw the flyby, establish your power. Even here, far from the capital, chaos is spreading. Your lands are threatened by ambitious warlords, Yan Bai Hu, and their greed cannot go unpunished. Those who call the southern or south lands home, and others around the land sympathetic to your cause, must now rally to defend a way of life in danger of vanishing forever. And our first mission is to engage... No, is to actually capture a falling settlement and we'll get support of the people. So the first battle here is not part of the mission. Uh, regardless, we'll fight that anyways for us to even get to uh, the territory here. Now, taking a look at the map before we jump into anything, you see that we are at war with Dong Zhuo and the High Empire, which is his vassal. To the north, we have Liu Yao, occupying two-third of Danyang, which is a really good commander to grab. And then on the salt mine, we have um, Sheng Xian, who is over here. And these are basic weak factions that we can wipe out anytime we want. We also have Wang Long here in Kuaiji. And he is surrounded by two yellow turbans, and he's actually at war with them. So the first move you really want to do on turn one is have a chat with him. Uh, trade would be nice, but what we want to do is offer him some assistance against these Yellow Turban Rebels. So, he's willing to pay us 3.9. Now, I think this value can be improved, if I'm not mistaken. I believe if we wipe out the army in front of us cleanly, Lu Kang's army, he will actually give us 4.2, uh, if my memory serves. And basically, you're trying to sign this deal with him. Now, of course, if you fight the battle and you take damage, uh, that's not going to work out. Uh, we got two items here. In all your campaigns, you're going to start out with a few extra, actually. So notice we have Traitor and Stone Monkey. You start out with a gold weapon. Uh, there's a spear for your brother. There's no extra armor. You start out with a silver white horse. You always have a builder item quite useful for early administrator which you have one available to you from the beginning and in terms of items you start out with two bows and the stone pig so quite a few items on Yamahu at the beginning of the campaign and if we take a look at this unique mechanic uh, each of the small dots represent a potential ally or coalition member and each of the big characters here represent what bonus you get when you reach there so for example if we have one coalition or ally we'll get what's called the White Tiger Bond, symbolized by the character for uh, life or fate uh, in Chinese. And what they have here is actually incorrect usage of the values. It should be minus 3% cost of establishing outlaw and outcast connections. Now, each connection is a different colored reform on your bandit network reform map. And by establishing these, you get discount to the cost, not increase to the cost. So this is a simple typo 
uh, that's unfortunately not going to get fixed in the future. Uh, we also see the recruitment cost discount correctly written for all the non-bandit units. And this will increase once you get two more, total of three coalition member or allies to the White Tiger Accord, symbolized by the character for bravery. And we get farther discounts for everything here. Two more, we get White Tiger Union, symbolized by the character for ascension or elevation. And we end up with increased bonuses. Finally, three more, total of eight. We get the White Tiger Empire, symbolized by the symbol for tiger. And what we have here at the highest level is a 15% discount to Outlaw and Outcast, which I think is the red reforms. We have Clandestine and uh, Corruption 20% discount. That is the blue reforms. Faith and Folly are the purple ones, 10%. Tribes and Traditions are the green ones, which are 25% and 20% recruitment discount cost for all non-banded units. And if we hover over the banded network, which we can do starting from turn one, you can see all these colors uh, spread around the map. And we start out over here uh, with some increased damage to Spear Infantry, uh, there is sadly not too many great uh, reforms in the south. Typically, I always advise going for these movement ones up in the northwest. Uh, there's a really awesome one here, Healer of Tijo, which gives 5% replenishment. Clearly, these are too far away from us to really focus. We have to get those eventually uh, in the late game, essentially. Uh, around us, uh, there's really nothing that stands out like a must-have. So you can go whichever way. If you want to save time in terms of being efficient with your research, focus on the ones with a shaded uh, area of the commandery, meaning that you own at least a piece of it. This will speed up your research rate uh, compared to ones you don't own. So we can start here if you want to save some turns. Or um, the one that I think is like slightly useful would be this one, because it gives minus 20% upkeep cost for all range unit. And one of our unique unit, the White Tiger Raiders, the one that I say you should run mainly for the mid game or early game even, uh, you can even bring it into the late game. The fact that they have snipe makes them very, very powerful. Uh, having 20% discount for those unit is very, very useful. Uh, in general, range units are still quite powerful in the game and having any sort of upkeep discount is definitely great. And you get one you know, horseback archer on top of that and you can lead it into some of these purple uh, reforms, which typically are really, really good in terms of pushing how strong your faction is with the corruption reduction and all the relationship boost. So I would advise going over here. So I usually start here and just work our way. Uh, nothing in the early game is going to really make or break your campaign. So feel free to take your pick here. Alrighty, so with that settled, uh, we can actually fight and we can showcase how strong our ability of Poison Volley is, because this is really going to carry you for pretty much uh, your early to mid game. I mean, you're still going to use this in the late game, but you have good units at that time. Uh, whereas now, you're just dependent on this to really deal damage. So let's hop into our first fight. Now, the game has this designed really weirdly. Because of the way the river is designed, they did a map redo in the south. And now this first battle is actually going to exhaust all your movement because you're forced to cross over a river even though there's a bridge here, but he doesn't take the bridge. So it's really, really awkward. But let's do this fight anyways. And you absolutely want to fight this manually. Uh, Liu Kang is a great uh, character historically. He's very old. I think his bonus provides some public order. It's nothing significant. You don't need to keep him alive. You want to duel him to get experience to help you level up because you do start out the game only at level one. So just hop into battle. Alrighty, we're gonna just hide our units in the forest. Uh, we have guerrilla deployment. We're just gonna run right up here. We're gonna turn off dueling. We're gonna ask him to duel us. There's a big difference of experience you gain depending on who requests the duel. It's about six times the difference. So you definitely want to always be the one asking for it. Uh, this is going to go fairly in our favor. We have no active ability to use in this fight. He has hamstring, but it's not really going to stop us from killing him. So as this fight takes on in the background, we can talk about his faction mechanic of forming 
coalition members or alliance members. It is, it is one of the more difficult achievements uh, to get in the game. There's an achievement in the game where you get basically all eight members. And the reason why it's really hard to form these large coalition is once your coalition size goes up, anytime you want to add a new member, everyone in the coalition have to vote on it. And you only have one vote. So if your other members don't want to accept the new member, then you really have nothing that you can do about that. So the only way I know that can really help you in that regard is just to create your own vassals using the underlings, which are the administrators for bandits, and then you want to liberate them um, after you grant them independence as we stab him in the face, uh, which fully heals us, so we actually took no damage. Uh, his units will actually come chase us, of course. They're gonna try to avenge their leader. And we're gonna showcase our poison volley ability. So let's get a little closer. We're gonna target one at a time. Now, usually you wanna hit them across the face. That way, all the arrows hit everyone. But there's a reason why we're only hitting one. Because I want to chase down all the kills for experience. So I don't want to make that unit injured at all. As we want to just chase this routing unit off the field. Nope, nope, don't do that. Leave them alone. Chase this guy right here. See, he's going to route. And if he starts running, I don't have enough time to chase both. But as I was saying, uh, you want to start forming coalition or alliance with people you uh, created as a vassal. That you guarantee their autonomy, that you liberated them so they feel really good about you. And then you want to repeat that process so that you form relatively small factions uh, who tend to be friendly to each other because they used to be all vassals of you. And hopefully you can get eight of those or seven. Of, actually, no, you need eight, eight of those uh, to form this. And if you are keen on getting the achievement, the best way to do this is do it in uh, easy difficulty because the diplomatic penalties against you will be much less. Um, therefore, you have an easier time getting that. Uh, achievement done. Normally, I wouldn't stress about it. The decrease of cost for research is not a great reward. So working hard to maintain that many coalition or alliances where you have to protect them if they get attacked is simply not worth it. So it's probably best that you, you know, build the research grounds when you build the sub county to speed up your research than say go really hard for that coalition. Uh, we might not pull this off. I might have to kite unless they stop charging. Uh, you can see that we pulled out our swords. Get some distance on them. Should be good. Now, if you write bad like that, it's always a little bit tricky to use when people charge at you. Good thing this is infantry. If it's cavalry, you'll never get a chance to use it. And you can see why we don't need actual units in the early game, because we have that ability. There's four use only. Um, you can wait it out. Cooldown 60 seconds. I can even shoot my bow. There we go. We're gonna farm all the kills, or else we're gonna split evenly with all our retinue. We're gonna, you know, disband the retinue at the end of the turn, so we. Are not going to share this experience at all. We're going to hog every single point to help us level up faster. All right, done. All right, so the result of that battle is we took zero damage and we leveled up. So our military power should go up. Ah, so we did capture him. So in this case, you actually would want to recruit him. It is public order, and you want to employ him. If you don't capture him, it's fine. It's not going to affect your gameplay. Obviously, capturing him helps you a little. We level up. Now, there's a few ways to go here. Usually, for most Sentinel Bandits, you want to just come over here and pick up stealth. Yan Bai Hu actually should go this route too, because he himself does not actually come with stealth. 
Oh, stock. Oh, he does. I guess this armor does give it to him. It's weird, because it's written outside on the menu, but no longer here on the background, which is interesting. Because it said enable stock, but not here on the text. Uh, regardless, you do have it. So in this case, you can go the top route. Uh, the only reason you might want to come here is to pick up patience faster, uh, because you don't need this skill. Stealth is no longer needed for you. For most other Sentinels, you actually do want to pick up stealth. This is really good for setting up your poison volley shot, because you can sneak up to the enemy and then spray them across the entire enemy line without getting chased by those cavalry. Uh, in this case, we'll just improve our range capabilities first. Uh, the skills are pretty interesting on him too. He has the unique bandit stalker ability here for his um, leftmost active ability. It's not very useful for him because his unique unit has snipe. You don't need to actually... Uh, his armor gives his unit stock. So essentially, his unit do not need this bonus. This is a duplicate bonus for his unit. Of course, if you are running, let's say, uh, another retinue, you want to run them closer to him within 50 meters to give this bonus over because they don't have snipe, then maybe. But because you're playing a faction that has a unique unit with snipe, I think this is rather you know useless and pointless. Uh, but his middle skill is quite unique, Tactical Withdrawal. So this affects everyone around you, allies, and they will gain a burst of speed some melee evasion, but they will lose melee attack rate. This is when you want to reposition, get yourself out of fights. That includes yourself, in case you're getting chased after you do fire off your perfectly lined up poison volley, you could use this to run away essentially. And uh, that's probably where we're headed first, even though I think getting patience early is pretty good too. Now that we looked at our general and we leveled up, we can first go back to a negotiation with Wang Long, who I mentioned. If we wait after the battle, huh, I swore it was 4.2 last time I checked. But regardless, we could do this before or after, I guess it doesn't really matter. Anyways, you'll be getting a bit of cash from him. And we mentioned before how this is a 20 turn cash payment. Yeah, I remember I done a deal for 18 during the test. I don't know why this is less. Very awkward. Uh, we are going to get paid for the full amount, though, for this, because uh, we will honor this treaty against the Yellow Turban Rebels, and we will actually fight them. So in that case, we are going to try to maximize this value as much as we can. So we can offer things like um, trade is positive. I think that's the only thing that is actually positive. Um, the, the thing about this is I can only lift this value by fit by... Not even that much. Uh, I was thinking 15 points, because each point is about 0.2. But in this case, it's much less. 29 instead of, I think it was 17. So we only got 12 extra here. Whereas if I do a regular deal, take a look. This is worth a lot more, right? I'm actually wondering if I can do this deal first, because there's a lot of good things about doing this deal first. His economic power would actually increase if we do this deal first, because he's going to make more money, obviously. Due to the trade deal, he gets money from the trade deal too. I'm wondering if that's some way we can actually improve this, or is it still going to be 17? Oh, my bad. 16. Right, it's still the same. It didn't change. Um, that's fine. We talked about how there is no impact to the value aside from military power. So we can totally just honor this deal. Although before I do that, I want to test a few things out. Because I'm still feeling like, why do I not see 4.2 now? Because the only thing I've done before that's different is maybe I fired everyone. So the reason why we grabbed him is not because I want to use him. He's old, I guess I said. The only reason we grabbed him is so that we can banish him to get money from him. Our starting roster includes our brother, who is relatively happy with us. Each banish will hurt him by 5 points. He is quite useful for the fact that he has mending. 
Um, and then we have three other generals who are all bandits and all pretty useless, except for maybe Huanglongbo in the beginning. The reason why I think he's slightly useful is because he has, uh, I mean, this skill right here. Cordial usually is good for administrators, which gives a little commerce, but in this case, not so useful because uh, you don't want your bandit characters to be your administrators. They don't have the skills. And there's not much commerce skills for bandits. So this is pretty pointless. You want skills that gives all income sources because bandit income is your main income source. But what I value on him is he actually has this skill right here that drops your public order by five points because this is something that we want to do to our own city since we might need to spawn a few yellow turban rebels to keep the contract going since there is only two very small settlements to take once you take them you still need to last 20 turns with him with that deal or else you're going to end up not honoring it so spawning a few rebel is actually quite nice and he also has decently high expertise especially if you switch his armor He's currently using the minus 12 armor, switch to minus 5. You get a decent amount here. You can also give him the builder, minus 1 turn, and it's 8%. That's very respectable. So uh, you don't have any other items, uh, at least not the starting default ones. So what we're going to do with him is we're going to make him our administrator here, or it's called underlings. A little bit different on the bonus profile in, in terms of the corruption and the all income boost. I think for typical administrator is straight up minus 30. No effect to neighboring commanderies and also 15% to all sources instead of 10. But we're gonna put him into that position and then we're gonna go to our court and everyone else that we have will be banished till we get 800 from them. This should not affect our military strength at all because the military strength is the units we have on the field. We also want to hire someone in turn one. This is very new. Only Yan Bai Hu can hire someone in turn one. And this lovely lady here has no past loyalties, means she's definitely not a spy, also willing to spy for us. And she starts out with Poison Volley. And you want to banish your people first because she's not there for the banishment, therefore she's not hit with any of those punishments. Your other two generals are hit, but they're fine. So he looks really low right now, but he's going to actually gain a lot of points every turn uh, because he's now the underling. So don't worry about him. We also get to choose her skill tree. Her background of fugitive officer is a generic one. It's quite nice for your first army since there is the 10% recruitment cost discount. You want to head over here and then give her stock. She definitely does not have stock. But that's it. You can't actually move anymore because of how awkward the river placement was. Um, if the developers had put you right here, it would have been better. But instead, we got this. Um, so now we have to wait a turn before we can do our turn one mission. But you don't need any of your retinue to do that. But before we cancel, right, getting ahead of myself, I want to re return to this deal and see if it changed. Because I, I don't know why it's not 4.2 this time. Ah, it is 4.2 now. Apparently, when you fire everyone, your military strength goes up. So it seems like on you know, my test runs, I always fire the people first. That's why I keep remembering 4.2. Uh, that is actually very interesting how you fire people and it still gets higher. And we do get the 18 full value instead of 16. That's worth good, like 40 more coins for us. And we're not done with him on turn one. Uh, what we can do with him is we can shift this over 15, like we usually do, and we can get a positive non-aggression if we want. We can even get a positive military access. This is up to you. Uh, the whole idea is to throw him one coin at a time to shift his attitude from his current towards his trending. Once it's above 15, I think it takes about four or five coins. Um, he will change his opinion of you, which is the only thing holding back these deals. Um, actually, currently says distance, but it will be positive 0.6 or something like that once it's above 15. And you can get a little bit of money, especially if you throw in like a food. Not a major source of income, so you don't need to worry too much about it. And the reason why we signed a mercenary contract with him is because on turn one, from all the factions that we know, he's the only one at war with someone. Uh, we're at war with them. So in this case, we can offer him 
the fight, so we get rewarded for it a bit early. Alright, so that's all done. We got our first mission for the contract to go fight any army or garrison belonging to Yellow Turban Rebels. We're going to elite these so we don't have to actually pay for their upkeep. That should boost our economy. And speaking of our economy, the first building I usually build is always the Tribute Hall. Good for post-battle loot income, good for construction costs for all future buildings here, and also the diplomatic income in case we have vassals in the future. And it does have an open assignment. I actually recommend just leaving it because both of them are going to be joining Yanbai Hu in the army very soon, so we don't actually want them to be spending time doing assignments. Uh, we do start out with a spy position. No one's willing to turn coat, so really nothing going on here. We can't change tax rate because our um, faction rank is too low. I know there's so many of you who talk to me about you know changing tax rate on your bandits because when you change tax going high, you actually make more money depending on um, if you had more retinues versus you have more generals because the trade-off is between retinue upkeep and character salary. Uh, one will go up, other one will go down depending on how you shift this instead of public order. So you could play around with this. Sometimes you make more money when you have low taxes. Sometimes you'll make more money when you have high taxes, depending on how big your roster, how big your armies are. But you can't touch tax rate on turn one. So most of those advice you've been throwing at me, it's pointless because you have to hit at least the bandit rank, I believe, to change your tax rate. Um, and like all non-Han factions, you still have preset upgrade bonuses, how many armies you get, how many underlings you get, how many spies, and so forth. So there's no customization for these. So you can just get used to, or can just double check what you will get when you do tier up and what you currently have. Alrighty, so we are solid on turn one. We got all our deals done. We moved our army, didn't lose a single man. We have a fight against garrisons coming up. Let's continue. He is angry, but he's not going to leave us, so don't worry about it. Alright, we do want to finish our mission first before we move on to help him. He's actually going to march towards here pretty quickly. So you don't want to waste too much time. You definitely want to get there quickly. And then if you look at the routes, it's actually quite difficult for you to get there. Unless you walk through like here, pass through here, and then use this road right here to get through. You can't actually walk through here. It's, it's all dense forest. So we're going to have to rely on some movement trick down the line. But for now... We're going to be fighting right here. And this looks terrible for us, but you've seen the poison volleys. Shoot one at each of them. Easy victory. So let's do that. Alrighty. So we have stock. The AI is not going to see us, so they will actually keep all their troops kind of in the middle. But they cheat. So they have one, you know, at the gate waiting for you. Don't worry about it. Just walk in through another gate. They will see you once you try to capture, but we're gonna disappear off screen pretty quick. We're getting shot at by this archer unit. No need to waste any poison volley on them, just chase them. Scrimmage mode is gonna have them running away from you. And even if they want to shoot you, what most likely will happen is that they will do much more friendly fire. Okay, we're stuck by that little village. There we go. We just need to disappear out of sight for a little bit, let our stock kick in. There we go. Now they don't know where we are. And we can kind of plan our attack accordingly. And somehow they saw us because... Yeah, because what? How did they see us? Anyways, we don't have to worry about it. That archer militia or archer is not going to end up killing us. We're just going to loop around the spear. We're going to do this on three times. The goal, obviously, is to charge them. And we get rid of this unit. Pesky little archer militia here. And once you see them uh, turn white, that means we, you know, they shattered. We don't have to chase them, because it's a garrison fight. Every single kill will go shared among your units. In this case, you're the only unit, so it'd be all yours. Give them a poison volley. And now we're just waiting for cooldowns. You can capture anything you want. Couple more seconds. Just wait a little bit. Alright. I'm gonna play it safe, build some distance.
Would you like to route? Nope, does not like to route. Use our bow. Shoot him a couple times. All right, they're gone. Shoot the others. I mean, if you have a bow, use it. And we're waiting for the cooldown. They're gone. One left. Wait for cooldown. And we win. Yeah, stock and poison volley, very very strong. Alrighty. We'll be occupying this, and we'll get our next mission, which will be your economy growth if you build something in the capital. So we're gonna delay that until we own more commanderies. So what we're going to do instead is don't touch any buildings here, convert this to the bandit version, and build out this first as we continue to expand. And because we absorb all that experience, we are level 3 already. Poison arrows at the ready. We want to hit 4. 4 is when we can recruit our faction unique unit, and that's when we're going to have our first army, once our generals all hit level 4. Typically, we can't move anymore at this point, but we do want to set up this move. So what we're going to do is raise an army here using our brother and um, our newly recruited uh, general here with a poison volley. We haven't even taken a look at her, but I think we're going to have her summon first and then summon our brother on top. They will also lose all their retinues. She starts with poison volley. And what we're just going to do here is recall her to give him full movement and then we're going to have him march around to here that way all we have to do is recall us right here and next turn the two brothers can attack this together uh, this is a bit stronger of a retinue yellow turbans have cavalry which is a little bit trickier to fight but they do have three range units, which is quite easy to chase down. Um, you have a couple options. You don't have to attack it right away. This movement trick, you know, gives you a lot of leeway. You can even wait. Um, actually, no. I, I highly recommend you attacking it right away because he will get here in like two turns, and you can just wait. The other alternative is you can actually go for this um, using a proxy. So what you would do is you would actually summon your administrator here. And then both your brother and the girl recall the administrator, have these two fight this and capture it, and then march Yen Bai Hu over here next turn, recall them, and then on the turn after, the third turn, you actually come and grab this. And the whole idea is we want to grab these to not only keep our points high, but also to limit Wanlong's growth. Because if we take both of his counties, which are the commandery portion that we would want as bandits, we would want as many of the counties as possible that we kind of just wall him in and the rest of the south would be just ours so that's one way to look at it anyways you see that his point has bounced up quite a bit the banishment is going to go away slowly and he's not going to get any desire for higher office he'll be at 24 points soon enough uh, if you you know you, you obviously will have a lisa stone pig so that he will be above you know 30 points he wouldn't even be complaining or making an impact on your faction there's no debuff from him, basically. Alright, we're good to go. Uh, let us continue. Yeah, Valon usually would make his move around Spring, uh, which, you know, it'd be too late for him. This is actually quite unfortunate. Bandits get characters starting in Winter, and the best I've seen is Chen Gong and Ziling. You know, Zhou Tai. Zhou Tai would be the best. Uh, those characters that start out without factions start to have a chance to join you during this turn. You obviously have enough money to recruit anyone you want. In this case, sadly, there is no one there uh, that we would actually want. Unless she has items, but I don't think so. Yeah. So there's really no point. We'll just focus on what we came here to do. And that is to take this yellow turban settlement. I don't think there's a reason for anyone to lead in particular. No one has any wind commanding skill that's really good. 
that's relevant for this fight. Um, you always start out with a spear, give it to your brother. This weapon's okay. Yeah, uh, you can give you can give her a bow as well if you want. You do start out with it. Just do a little bit of extra damage. Alright, the game's actually going to give us a heroic victory, which is nice, because we can actually save us some fighting. If you fight it, you can obviously win this. You have 8 sets of Poison Volley, 4 sets of Mending Heal. There's no reason you should lose to this group. And we get this Fame and Fortune, which is the resource for the uh, mercenary contract. You can choose to give the land to the owner of the contract. You get more Fame and Fortune, you get money, but obviously you will lose the land. In this case, I don't want to give it to him. I'm just going to occupy it. It's going to be my land. And we pay, get paid a thousand on top of that. Nice level up. We'll be picking up flexibility. He is your next in line, so this will help you faction wide. You obviously want to get reach as well. Just recall both of our sentinels so they heal. And we'll be headed over here very, very soon after. Get this conversion out of the way. You converted this, so time to build a mini building. This is our faction unique building here. And we can take a look at it. Unlike the typical four standard bandit sub buildings, the Shanyue Enclave has an upgrade. And what this does is you can see this is correctly written, where you get decreased cost to establishing tribes and tradition, which is the green reform. There's a lot of green reform, and you get food, and you get one limit for what the unit is called the Yue Tribesmen. And we can take a look at the unit right here. Um, doesn't show you the stats, but it's pretty much a slightly uh, similar to Spear Guards. It's really not that powerful. I don't recommend it. The unit here, the Yue Remnant Warriors, is a little bit better. They're kind of like Huang Lao's Paragon from the Yellow Turban roster, not as high damage, slightly better armored. Uh, but once again, you have limited recruitment of these. You will need a ton of these buildings to be able to recruit these in mass. And it's really not worth it. Um, the only thing that I can say that could work in terms of a strategy for these is if you commit to stacking the cost reduction for the green reforms, it could come to something very useful, right? At 50, which, you know, it's a lot, but you can see you can get there with the help of this, perhaps, because the tri tri um, the tribes and traditions actually stack up pretty quickly. But you, you need 50 counties, right? That's if you say the average of two counties per commandery, that's still 25 commanderies. You're well into the late game. But once you do get to that point, every single green reform on this map would be one would be free, right? It'll be just one turn. You click it, you get it the next turn, which is still not worth it because I think mathematically you would just you don't need to have a hundred percent right because even if it's zero turns it's not going to be free in game you don't just click and get it you still need a turn so anywhere close to like 80 percent you're probably good uh, but I don't like that method I don't like the unit at all I prefer to just stick to either black market if I want money or preparation camp if I want to spam research rate because think about it spamming decrease cost on research versus increasing research rate. It's almost the same idea, but this is also not restricted to just green reforms, but all four colors. So if I can stack five per county, if I take the same 50 counties, for example, I will increase my research rate by 250% plus the base 100%, we're at 350%. It's not as strong as minus 100% because increasing percentage versus decreasing percentage is not linear. So for example, if I'm at you know 350% and something is uh, say eight turns, it will still take me you know um, divided by 3.5 instead of divided by one. Instead of eight turns, I still need to spend two point something turns on it, which is three turns. So it shaved me five turns off, but if I have minus cost at 50%, it will be free, right? Essentially it'd be free. So it's weaker for sure, but you can apply this to all four colors. So if you wanted to do research boosting, this would be the building to go. Plus, this building also gives 
plus one cover cost per turn when spying faction wide for all your characters. That's actually super good. And if you notice, this is the only building that does not provide prestige. So it actually slow you down in terms of leveling up your faction. So there's a couple reasons to go against this faction unique building. It's actually kind of an oversight in my opinion. I feel like they should have just given this building prestige because there's not many ways for bandits to get prestige from the counties. Whereas for Han factions, they get prestige from the county buildings. So they're making up for it by giving you these buildings. But in this case, for this one, you don't actually get any. So I think that's a mistake. Here, just stick to income. All right, that's done. We're going to work on this one, and then we're just going to recall everyone. Because we're not running actual armies, we can have high flexibility in terms of where we want our armies, and we can easily go take that soon after. But let's continue for now. Alrighty, let's see if we get any unique. Nope, unfortunately, no unique generals on this run. A bit sad, actually. Move to the edge of your territory. Recruit your brother and the girl. They have a general here. So ideally, you actually want the general to come out and fight you. For each fight you get, you get a certain amount of points, right? So the more they fight, instead of fighting one battle for both the county and the army, if you get two fights, you're getting more bang for your buck in terms of mercenary treaty value. So we're actually going to just walk this army in a little bit. I don't think they feel they're strong enough to beat you, but they might be tempted to come out and fight you. We'll see. Or maybe they'll run away if they think you're too strong. They can do a chase down fight. And the backup plan, of course, is how we're trying to mess up our public order. There's a few ways you can work on to get this even worse. Um, pretty much what you can do is raid your own land. Remember, there's the raiding stance that you can take where you get minus 18 public order. So you can spawn a few yellow turban rebels just to keep the contract alive. Uh, now, of course, the reason why this contract is so difficult is because even though we can wipe out all the ones around him, there's other yellow turban rebels around the map. Or else, usually, if you can wipe out a faction early, then the contract is deemed fulfilled. Uh, but not the case in this scenario because there's other ones around. All right, we're going to get all of this set up. We're going to do the black market here as well. And then back here, I'm going to start upgrading the commandery. We're going to use this to activate your economy growth. Yeah, I don't think we're hiring anyone. Now, the farmer here is not useless. The agricultural development um, you know, uh, assignment is quite good for leveling up green buildings. And you actually have quite a few green buildings. So I would actually recommend hiring him. Uh, maybe not this turn because then you have to pay upkeep, but in the next turn maybe consider hiring him and using him for that assignment just when this one's about timeout. So maybe wait two turns here. I think he'll still be around. Uh, let's continue for now. All right, he didn't run for it, so we're going to have to fight him here. It's the same retinue plus the general, so technically it should feel harder. If you really want to milk the experience, so that you know you get more points you would just starve out let them fight you that way you get two sets of points for fame and fortune uh, meanwhile back here this still has one more turn i think he's still in the roster right yes so we're going to give it one more turn just let them come fight us this we will start upgrading after we activate our your economy girls so let's just go all right, they fell for it. They came out to fight us. Uh, we're going to beat them back. Obviously, they're not going to get completely killed, right? Um, so that, ooh, he has a labor recruiter, which is quite nice. Let's see if we can get that. Uh, but we're probably going to duel him to get experience, so we might not get it. It's not like a gold item, so it doesn't really matter. Let's just fight. All righty, so we actually have a few things that can help us. Because of our bandit skill tree, we actually get to start out with these. Um, they can only be placed within our deployment zone, that's the only limitations. The enemy cavalry are not stupid. They see this, they're not going to run into it. So you need to hide them in the forest, and then you need to lure them over. And this can be a secret weapon of ours, in case those two cavalry unit proves to be a little bit harder to deal with than we imagined. I'm going to keep my brother back here. For the two of us that have guerrilla deployment, we're going to go deep into the forest here. 
on this area where we can really deploy. This is the edge of the map, I believe. And we're going to do a few things with these two boys and girls. For him, uh, he doesn't want to duel us. So he only wants to duel the weaker ones, not surprised. I'm going to go sneak up. They don't see us. Uh, we're going to go over there and use our poison volley. Get a little closer too. We have 94, 95 speed, oh, 94, 99 speed. Their cavalry have 75 speed, so we can outrun them. They already saw us. They saw her poke out of the forest in and out. She'll bait them back over there. We have stock. Even if we're not in the forest, we're fine. Remember, the archers will shoot us if they see us. I want them to clear this tree line, and I want to poison volley on them. Maybe we'll, we'll go right here. They'll see us at this distance. What is the active ability? Oh, armor. Can I just fire, please? There we go. Does he want to duel? No. Alright, we're backing off. And we'll disappear into the forest again. We're in the harassment business. Alright, I'm gonna go circle around. Those archers will shoot at us. Right, they're refocusing on her. And we're invisible once again. We're gonna lure them over to the trap. And once they come out of this forest, when we get a clearing, get another shot down. Actually, we'll wait till they get to this clearing. Oh, they can shoot at her. We got our four shots out. Time to disappear again. We're focusing on that unit because that's a captain unit. Think of that as a general. When he falls, all his retinue will actually lose morale. And we do want to route everyone here. Alright, don't be shy. We can come out too now. And I'm just going to convince them to not come back with a little charge right here. Turn on our bow. Trying to charge us. Alright, let's lead the cavalry back to where we want them to go. All they have left is really just the cavalry. And I have four heals left. So the idea here is we'll just lead them straight into it. We will run into a few, but they have way more cavalry than we do, so they're going to run into way more than we are. And once within the heal distance, how you want to use mending is you want to use it on yourself. And everyone near you will also get it too. And right, now we'll just stand here, wait for them to come over. And obviously try to step on those. I have two more shots on him, 
three more shots on her. There's just like, oh, they're bumping into it. I can see them. And if they, <laughs> they got smart. The AI is pretty smart regarding these. We'll just loop them around. Yes, we'll get less experience this way, but I really want that fight. So in case he keeps declining, I mean, in that case, he's usually accepting, but just in case. Just want to make sure... Ah, oh, she still got bumped into that. I want to mend myself to give my brother some armor boost and melee evasion boost. Can you get him? Use it. That cavalry hit enough of the things to rout. Now we just fight them. We overpower them everywhere. Alright, watch our brother finish off the duel. Nice. And we win, I believe. We'll let them run away. That would get two fights. Alrighty. 12 points of fame and fortune. Pick up some income. Alright, we even got some extra experience. And this is the Mercenary Treaty Reward. Every few turns, uh, usually on increments of 5, there's a chance that your mercenary lord will give you one of these offers where you get a gift. It doesn't, it's not always, this is not saying you get a horse, but it's just saying a, a gift horse is here. You can pick an item, in this case common or refined because we're in this tier. If we move up, it can be gold. There's a chance to be gold. 750 cash. We can decline and pick up more points to get better rewards in the future. Or, we can drop 5 points to get both. In this case, I think it's better to decline here, because a common or refined, which means, you know, bronze or no color, it's not that good. We want to shift it up, so the next time he offers this to us, we can get maybe a silver item out of it. Oh, we also got a flying dagger from just the, the, the tur end turn process. They summon the new general with the same item, they just share the equipped item over. We gotta level up so we can even get higher capture rate. Do you have a better chance of getting that item? And, and this turn is when we're gonna look at this roster, recruit him. He's very high level, so he's gonna be very hard to keep happy. Um, right now, this is okay. Uh, it's not gonna, you know, you can give him items, you can give him titles. There's a lot of things you can do, but we don't really worry about that. All I want him to do is be on assignment for his agriculture development, which is activated because he's a farmer background. Minus two construction time for all green buildings. That means this building here. That means this county here. Also double food production. We can trade those away for value. And uh, once this activates next turn, and once he's on duty next turn, we'll also have your economy grows active. And we can then use these three turns of additional minus one turn, minus 20% cost to just push our buildings up, especially this one all the way to tier three. And also level this up level this up to a small city, just get our economy rowing. And we're saving that because now we have another county where we can build stuff, and very soon we're going to take that pretty much as well. Now, as for the fight here, we can just delegate this. There's no reason. 91% chance to capture with that patience upgrade. Although I think she got killed. We'll be keeping it. Now, at this point, we have more than 60 points. It's 50 right here. It's hard to tell, but basically it means each turn, the decay is 4 points, 15 turns. Even if we do nothing, we honor the treaty already. We won't be getting much reward, but we're good, because there's no more yellow turbans around us. And all you want to do now is just recall this group, and you want to set them up to go attack. The weaponsmith over here next turn and start taking the rest of these land from the Han Empire, which is just a pushover. Don't spend your early money on colonizing. What will most likely happen is that he will actually come to sell down and colonize some of these land, 
you're really only interested in the counties for the most part, so you don't have to worry about taking over these. Although getting a harbor is quite useful, but the harbor you really want in the early game is actually Danyang. If you can take control of the entirety of Danyang by going to war with them, obviously, you pretty much want to fight around this way. And by this time, all three of your generals should be around level 4. And then you can field an actual army, and then you can beat Liu Yao and uh, Sheng Xian. Make that your capital, you want to move it, because then you have a harbor for trade from your capital for the rest of the map. And you can actually trade with pretty much the entire map from this spot. Um, because the restriction in the river is just right here, which means you can trade with all the faction over here. You can sail down all the factions over here. You can sail up all the factions along the coast here, as well as all the way to Luoyang right here. So that's going to maximize your trade potential, and you have a pretty smooth start. There's no one really strong around you. Yanbai Hu is a very easy faction to play. You start out with some very powerful um, and very capable generals. So hopefully you enjoy this guide, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!